The COURAGE trial suggested in the non-acute setting, medical or interventional therapy might actually be equal. And then come other trials that say, no, that's not true if you're looking at fractional flow reserve. So this whole concept of uh, physiology versus the anatomy, it's really become very important. And so I wanted to uh, talk to our editor-in-chief of Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, Jagat Narula, and thank you very much for spending some time with us because you have a paper in Jack that does a review on this wonderful topic. First off, this has to be an exciting time to be in imaging. It has always been an exciting time to be an imager, I can tell you that. And I've always said that if you are not an imager, you will not be a doctor. <laughs> That's the future of imaging. And uh, while people may be some, somewhat pessimistic about imaging, I'm, I'm always upbeat about it, as you very well know. Now, as far as this particular paper in Jack is concerned, I think uh, I am not the right person to uh, be talking to you because the person who took the real real brunt of the writing and uh, who really worked on it is uh, Lance Gould. And uh, I think uh, he did an absolutely a phenomenal job with the help of so many authors here. Right. And I think it is one of the masterpieces that you will be seeing in Jack soon. I agree. And so for this state of the art paper, let's just talk about this whole topic, what I talked about in the, at the very beginning. Where are we with this whole issue of what to use and when? I mean, we have talked about the anatomy and physiology of the coronary artery stenosis for a long time. But uh, it has really become important exactly as you said with the COURAGE trial and the two, uh, two um, staged FAME trial, the FAME and right. the FAME 2 trial. While one shows that uh, in the severe stenosis which was based on angiography, that was the COURAGE, in a five years time period there was not much of a difference in the adverse outcomes whether you had the upfront PCI or there was the medically, uh, medical treatment. And uh, in the FAME trials, you have seen that based on the FFR, the people who had less than 0.8 FFR, right. they, did worse, uh, they did better as compared to those who had more than 0.8, although the ana anatomic severity was, the, uh, was uh, severe in both the cases. That was the FAME trial. And then in the FAME 2, you saw that those who had less than 0.8 FFR, those subjects, if treated with the upfront PCI, did better as compared to the medical therapy. And it really brings into the focus whether we should be identifying the FFR in all these cases. Was there a cost if you went down one way or the other in terms of a negative? Uh, as far as the myocardial infarctions and the myocardial infarc uh, and the uh, so deaths are concerned, there was no difference in both the arms, okay. whether it was the COURAGE trial or it was the FAME uh, 2 trial. However, there was a significant decrease in the number of urgent revascularizations Which that were work. needed in the, in the uh, FAME 2. But if you really analyze the uh, COURAGE trial also, you would see that similarly, there was a decrease in the need for the revascularization in the upfront PCI arm. Now, there are similarities in the two trials. Again, looking at, yeah. Yeah, looking at the death and the myocardial infarctions, which are no different. And on the other hand, if you look at the revascularizations, they are significantly decreased over a period of time. The major difference in the two trials is, in one, you will have a much smaller follow-up in the FAME-2 study. And the question here is that if we had followed them longer, would it be that both the arms would have become equal? The uh, other important difference in the two studies was that FAME-2 seems to have less severe, uh, severely symptomatic subjects as compared, to the, as compared to courage. Now, this is only about the people with the stable disease and not, not an acute setup, as you would imagine. Now, if you really bring into focus the acute coronary syndrome also, and then look at the non-culprit lesions, for example, that was studied in prospect study. Yes. Here, you would find that the people with 35% lesion over a period of three years, those who developed an acute event on a non-culprit lesion, which is approximately 12% of cases, these became more stenotic as the period went by. So essentially, this, this really puts us into a, a, a situation where we, we need to realize as to the plaques, 
which are anatomically important versus functionally important or we really need to add a third arm also which is the morphology of a plaque that is it a stable morphology or an unstable morphology. So the plaques when they are bigger they would lead to the uh, inducible ischemia. The plaques which become bigger and if they have unstable morphology, they are the ones which will lead to the uh, adverse events also. So essentially the FFR works very well when we go uh, that route, but the difference is whether it's a stable plaque or unstable plaque. And in the same issue of Jack, you would be seeing another editorial by Dr. Moreno and me, where we have said that we have to start looking outside the lumen also. So looking out of the box or looking out of the lumen here. But in this particular uh, paper, what we have tried to discuss is what is the best way of identifying the functional uh, importance of a lesion? Would it be FFR or would it be the coronary flow reserves or would it be an absolute coronary flow reserve versus the relative coronary flow reserve? So this is a, a, a manuscript which just discusses that and if we really need to go that route, would there be another trial that would be needed to an extent? ischemia uh, trial, which is underway, is going to be addressing some of those questions, which could be considered a courage two type of a trial. And uh, similarly, you are going to see another one, which will be more like a FAME three type of a study, where you will be seeing the syntax based uh, 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 patients who would be divided to receive the PCI versus cabbage based on the FFR. But is it that is what we really need to know or do we need to go a step further and the step further is going to be should we throw in an OCT wire also and should we be able to see whether the plaque has a thin fibrous cap or it has got a large necrotic core which might lead to more of the acute events and the prospect too is going to be looking at that because it will be looking at the at the uh, the plaque burden. That is how it is proposed. And uh, similarly, secret two trial, which is actually looking at the plaques which are still not uh, significantly stenotic, may not have that kind of a large plaque burden, and it would be able to give us uh, some results about that where there would be the preemptive stents uh, given. And essentially, this really needs to be addressed because we have recently seen the PREMI study also and I can tell you that I'm still trying to grapple with the results <laughs> as to as to how to explain what we saw in the PREMI which is an important thing for us to explain and explore. So clinically speaking do you trust your eyes? Do you go with the angiographic image? Do you have to go in now and really see the fractional flow reserve or are there specific patients you do that with? How do you decide? I, I tell you the most important thing is that the patient has to be, if, if it is a stable disease, the patient has to be on the optical, uh, uh, optimum medical therapy. I think that would be the most important thing that you would require to do first so of all. So many are not, or they're on therapy, but not at correct doses, optimal doses. Uh, uh, yes. And, uh, but with the, with the fame results, how exactly would we be going ahead? I don't know. So you don't come down on one way or the other? The jury is still out there. I think we need more definitive trials before we can answer those questions one way or the other. And you mentioned the editorial that you, uh, that's also in the same issue, right? So in that particular editorial, we have discussed the relevance of looking at the plaque morphology in addition to the luminal stenosis and uh, tried to say that the plaques which are large, they are likely to result in an acute event as well as they could be the ones which will be able to in cause the inducible ischemia. So if the plaques are stable, they are likely to be only causing the inducible ischemia and most likely would not result in an acute event. On the other hand, if the plaque has an unstable morphology and if it is a large plaque, it is ready to rupture. So basically that is the one which will lead to the acute coronary event. So question is that can we pick up those which are really the ripe ones? Should we really go after those which are the ripe ones? Or is it that we have to pluck all? Right. So that's, that's another question which needs to be answered. And as we discussed, that the prospect two and the secret two may be one direction, may, 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 may be getting into this direction. Well, even if it's not a complex lesion, it certainly is a complex issue. And the editorial we were talking about is in Jack, as is Anatomic versus Physiologic Assessment of Coronary Artery Disease, which is a state-of-the-art paper in Jack. Please look through it for a, a much deeper, in-detailed uh, review of 
this rather interesting topic that we're now going to be looking at for at least the next year or so. For Cardiosource World News, I'm Rick McGuire.